Oh, he's got prominent people together. They held meetings because uh, for uh, at John ja Root's home for uh, uh, for about six weeks, and the. Um, Brown's original story expanded uh, that the meetings were then held not once a day, but twice a day. The followers grew to about 80 in number. So now he has a newspaper editor, a museum curator, scientists, retired printers, and solid citizens of Stockton. And all of these people believe that the cavern that uh, J.C. Brown claimed to have found led to the lost race and continent of Lemuria. Wow, wow, wow. So for everybody out there, you know, there's, there's a lot more to this earth than, than you know. And well, yeah, so here now, J.C. Brown tells the group, now he tells them his story. He's got 80 people assembled, and what he tells them is that in 1904, when he was employed with the Lord Cowjay Mining Company of England, he was hired to prospect for precious metals. And while he was there up in the Shasta area, he ran into a section of rock on the face of a cliff which didn't seem to match the surrounding formation. So while he examined the stone, he noticed that it blocked the entrance to what appeared to be a cave. Brown was a geologist, you know, and so he thought the entire scene was unnatural. He began to dig out the mouth of the cave, which was full of debris and vegetation. What he began to see, Vickens, was not a small cave. After much digging, he a tunnel, which curved downward into the mountain. Oh, really? So now he sees he's got a tunnel here, so he's equipped with lanterns, miners' paraphernalia, and he sets out to explore it. He claims to the group that three miles from the mouth of the tunnel, he struck, he struck a cross-section containing gold-bearing ore, and further on, he found another cross-section where, where he said an ancient race apparently had mined copper. So now he's got gold and copper that he's finding here, and... Uh, the decline continued, so now he went approximately 11 miles inside of the mountain. Now, this tunnel, he said, was 7 feet wide and 10 feet high. But after going 11 miles inside of the mountain, 2,300 feet from the surface is where he claimed he found what he called a village. And in the village, Vickens, there were streets laid out in the village, just like a regular town. Wow. Um, so... So it's right. So it's looking just like a, a like a human person or what you know whatever built it, just just sitting there, you know. Yeah, a, li a little city. You know, it's like uh, Woodbridge, New Jersey. You just found you know this you know the town. <laughs> right, just chilling there. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of uh, vacant towns in China right now, and they're, they're putting together a, a big metropolis. Yet. Um, you know, there's, there's still all these other civilizations, and even inside the Earth right now, there's, you know, there's people just chilling, you know. Would you, would you call them people or just, you know, other beings or what? Well, th these people, I, I, well, he claimed that they were Lemurians, but let me go on to tell you what he discovered after finding the village. He discovered two rooms filled with gold and copper tablets, and they, and they were... The room was literally full of plates, all inscribed neatly. He found tempered gold and copper shields that couldn't be made, you know, in 1904 that were made with radium, he thought. Some of the golden plates he found were engraved, and it looked like hieroglyphics, like Egyptian hieroglyphics. He found copper spears that you could bend, you know, like backwards completely, and uh, that, that, that defied, you know, uh, the technology of the early uh, 20th century. Then he opened up other chambers, and he found a place of worship that were like 13 statues made of copper that were there. And then what it looked like, he said, were there was things all thrown about, like somebody had left on the spur of the moment and, and must have realized he was coming. So it's like, you know, you, you, you leave your, your apartment a mess because, you, you know, you're late for work. <laughs> but, uh, so he realizes that there were people who, who just recently left. But then he came upon a very, very unusual scene. In one room, he found 27 skeletons. Now, a skeleton's not a big deal, but these were. The smallest of which, Vickens, was 6 feet 6 inches, and the tallest was more than 10 feet tall. Wow. And then, and then he made his real find. In another room, he found, embalmed by a secret process, the bodies of a man and a woman dressed in ornate royal robes, 
which he believed were the king and queen of this race. Uh, so, so it was like a little tomb area. With, with, so maybe it was family, family as well? Yes. So now Brown spends a number of days studying the hieroglyphics that he found. He decides to leave the tunnel and its contents exactly as he found them and return at a later date. But first he cleverly concealed the entrance and he marked it on his map so that way he knew exactly where it was on the mountain. So this is what he's telling the group in 19. So for six weeks he's telling them what they're going to find. And he, and he said to them, he says, at my expense we'll be leaving on the morning of June 19th at 1 p.m. in the afternoon and I'll take everyone up, you know, to, to Stockton, from Stockton up to Shasta area. And there are three caves, but two of the caves, for the people who come up there with me and help me catalog the items in the area that the Embalm King and Queen are, because I want to have those for, you know, for museums and artifacts. In the other two caves, the people who come up to help me, I'll make sure they have the gold and all the other, you know, treasures in those two caves. So the morning of June 19th, 80 people waited at the designated time for J.C. Brown to, to appear, but he never showed up. So it gets interesting because then the, the people said, well, we better call the police. So what do they do? They called the Stockton police, and they came in and did their investigation, but they couldn't find any trace of J.C. Brown. He had completely disappeared. So now the police, now you know the police are doing the investigation. The first, the first thing they start asking, well, how much money did J.C. Brown take from any of you? And, and the police asked all 80 of the people. And the only thing that they could come up with is that J.C. Brown might have borrowed five dollars while he was living in a federal shelter so one of the officers said well what was he doing in the federal shelter well he had told them in the federal shelter that the reason why he was there could because he was worth forty million dollars and if anybody knew he was a millionaire he would have been kidnapped because he had been kidnapped once before so here it is the man claimed to be worth forty million dollars he's incognito and he's coming there with a name like jc brown which might not have been his real name so the 80 people, though, they told the police they believed the old-timer, and they said that they believed in this vast tunnel in Mount Shasta and were convinced that maybe foul play, something had happened to J.C. Brown. Maybe somebody killed him or, or somebody kidnapped him again. So after reading this story, Vickens, I wrote down all the clues I'd learned from the legend, and then I decided to go to the New York Public Library and spend at least two weeks to a month and do my own investigation and see if I could solve the 73-year-old mystery surrounding the man known only as J.C. Brown. Wow. So, so what did you unravel that, you know? Well, yeah, well, hey, I'll, I'll break it down for you. One of the first questions that we would both ask was, was there a man named J.C. Brown? You know, was he really named J.C. Brown? I mean, that's a good question, a good place to start, right? <laughs> Definitely. Oh, so you think he would just change his name just to say, um, just to add another layer of security, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. So what I found out was I wasn't able to find anyone in the United States, you know, with the name J.C. Brown. So now the next question I have was, well, he mentions he worked for the Lord Cowdery Mining Company of England. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, is there a Lord Cowdery Mining Company? Did it exist, right? Logical question. Right. The answer was yes. I was able to find a record of the Lloyd Cowdery Mining Company. I was able to Google it, and the company came up. I go, oh, my God, you know, bullseye. So now there's a Lloyd Cowdery Mining Company. So now I'm figuring, okay, now I should be able to find a record of it. So my next question, Vickens, was, was the company named after the owner himself, Lloyd Cowdery? Was there a Lloyd Cowdery? Good question, right? Definitely. So what, what do you think, uh, so did, what did you find out about that? Well, there was a Lord Cowdery. I found out there was a man who uh, was a Lord Cowdery, but he wasn't born Lord Cowdery. His name was Wee Dickinson Pearson. So now I'm going, wait a minute. This guy's name is Whit Wheatman Dickinson Pearson. How did, you know, how is he Lord Cowdery? You know, how, what happened? So I had to research this and come to find out that in uh, January of 1917, he officially became known as the first Viscount Cowdray in England. 
And this was the most important clue that I would need to put all the puzzle pieces into place because now I made the connection that Lord Cowdrey was really Sir Wheatman Pearson or, or vice versa. Oh, wow. Um, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. So, so who, who, who do you think um, put him out there? So he, he, was he, like, just doing this work himself? or No, well, this is, this is where it gets interesting. Because I'm, I'm saying, okay, there is a Lord Cowdery, there's a Lord Cowdery mining company. My next question is, okay, i got to have a guy in the editor's office on, in, in May of 1934, you know, who disappears in June 19th of 34. Was Sir Lord Cowdery alive in 1934? Good question, right? Definitely. Well, well, the answer was no, he had died earlier. I ended up getting his biography, and I learned that he died in May of 1927. So I'm saying, okay, wait a minute. I got then I got to reread the legend. So now I had to turn my attention to someone who might have been a lieutenant in the organization. Because when I reread the biography, the man in the legend said that he worked his entire life for the Lord Cowdrey Mining Company, and he came back 30 years later. He waited till he retired from the company to reclaim the treasure. So now I says, wait a minute. This guy has to be a loyal lieutenant, a loyal, you know. Uh, person in the organization because he spent 30, 40 years with them, so it's not the owner. So when I, I figured that out, I'm in the New York Public Library there on 34th Street. I asked them, uh, is there a book on uh, Sir Wheatman Pearson and Lord Cowdery? They says there certainly is, but you got to go to the other library on the other side of town. So I did, and what did I find? I found you know the biography on the life of Sir Lord Cowdery. So now I'm sitting there reading it, and in, in there, there are photos of three other men that helped him build the, his organization. So I then started looking at the other three men, their age, their description, where they worked around the world for Lord Cowdrey, because he built the Sonar Dam. He was involved with building things in Mexico. So here's a man who was building a lot of things all over the world. So I had to find a guy who was close enough to the United States who was a, a, an underboss, so to speak, and uh, there were three guys that whose pictures I had in the biography. I was able to link the information to one of the three men, and, and the man's name was John Med Benjamin Body. And through further research, I was able to figure that he was the man who showed up in the office of the Stockton Record in 1934. Wow. And how I did that, how I, how I did that was, is that after I discovered this man, John Benjamin Body, fit all the criteria, I says, well, wait a minute. I said, if, he, if the man is not a U.S. citizen, then there's got to be border crossings coming in through either Canada, Mexico, or through Cuba to the United States that I could track. So this country is pretty good about being anal retentive when it comes to records of border crossings for the the alien manif manifest that you can find uh, in the New York Public Library uh, about people coming in and out of the country, you know, who are foreigners. So, oh, even currently? Yeah, currently. Yeah, I can I can go back as early as 1900 and tell you everybody who came into this country who wow. was not a citizen. Cool. So so what I did, Vickens, I said, okay, let's go, you know, check the records, and I did, and lo and behold. I found the man J.B. Body crossing through Mexico. I was able to trace him through Mexico. On fur further checking, I was able to have him, first crossing he came through in March 1904, he came in with his boss, Sir Wheatman Pearson, who was the Lord Cowdrey, Robert Adams, and W.E. Sayers. So on the first time they came into the States, the four of them came in, and this was in March of 1904. Then, in, in the legend, J.C. Brown had told them that he didn't find the tunnel on the first trip up to the Cascade Mountain Range. He found it on the second trip. So I looked at the border crossings, and there's his second trip in from uh, Laredo, Texas, into uh, from Mexico. And he's coming in with three other civil engineers, C.M. Yeomans, John McLaughlin, and Fred Kleisner. And J.C. Brown also brings in John Gilmartin, his own personal valet. So here's